Peter reminds us in his first epistle that we as believers have been redeemed not with corruptible things, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. From the book of Genesis, chapter 3, when Adam sinned, to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, when believers are in the presence of God, gathered together, and God himself is our tabernacle. There is one central theme in all of Scripture, and that is that a sinner, you and I, men and women, since the fall of Adam, are in need of redemption. Morality is not our primary concern, even though we are committed to the morals of Scripture. Man's problem is not just what he's done. Man's problem is what he is. And our actions, our attitudes, our life is really a reflection of the fact that sin dwells within us. And that's exactly how Paul states it in Romans chapter number 7. So this morning, as we go back to a scene that we looked at many weeks ago, in Exodus chapter 16, I'd like to ask you to turn there with me for just a moment. Our primary text this morning will be a New Testament text commenting on Exodus 16. But I'd like you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 16 as we begin this morning. And notice, if you would please, Exodus chapter 16. Listen carefully to verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> and they, the children of Israel, in their Exodus journey, and they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of Israel came to the wilderness of Zen, or wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people shall go and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. When we come to this particular scene, that word manna in our English Bible is actually a translation of the words, what is it? Israel did not know what it was God provided for them. Psalm 78 tells us that what God provided was angels' food. There are things about the description of this particular food that was given to Israel that actually we do not fully yet understand. But I can assure you it was a sufficient supply to daily take care of every need they had and to get them from this particular scene all the way to the land of promise. The bread in this particular passage was literal bread, but it pictures spiritually Jesus Christ who declared in John chapter 6, I am the bread of heaven. Before we go there, I'd like to remind us because we are living in a time when most of us are aware of our vulnerability. And that's a good thing. As much as we don't like it, it's good for us. It's good for us to recognize 
our finiteness, our limitation, our frailty, and the fact that we need God's sufficiency. And so let me take a moment here, and I noticed last week that uh, when, uh, give me just a moment, all I can think of is John Booth, and that's not the right name. Boy, I'm glad it wasn't John Booth. Jim Bartell. <laughs> he did a wonderful job. My heart was blessed. In fact, I was almost shouting when I saw the service. We went to Florida. For those of you who don't know, we dedicated our great-granddaughter to Christ. Most of the family on her husband's side is unsaved for the first time heard the gospel. It was a, we wept together. It was a blessing. When we open the Bible and we come to this passage, I think it's important to remind ourselves there is no problem that we encounter that God is not sufficient to me. When we think of what God did when he provided for the nation of Israel, they obviously are not where there's a local grocery store. They're in a desert. There are no fields to harvest from. And so they find themselves crying out to heaven, and rather than God in some way chastening them, reprimanding them, I'm reminded of the words of James when he tells us that when we find ourselves in confusion, we are to look to God who does not, and the word is in the original language, chide us. He does not reprimand us. He does not rebuke us. We may be deserving of such, but the truth of the matter is God's response is always grace. I would remind you, when we looked at this passage before, there were 600,000 men according to the scripture. Scholars estimate that the number of men predicted a certain size for the entire nation of Israel, women and children, of a minimum of two and a half million and possibly as many as three million people. And so a great amount of food was needed, if I may state it this way, impossible terms. And yet God provided. The amount of food needed daily was 2,000 tons of food. That would be three freight trains each a mile long every single day for almost 40 years. Firewood, just to cook and just to keep warm in the deserts at night, 4,000 tons, which by modern rails, carrying a gross capacity of 70 tons per car would require 58 cars, two miles in length. The water to drink and wash themselves, 11 million gallons of water a day. A modern tanker can carry 30,100 gallons of water and would require 67 tank cars two miles long. Now, why do I give you those statistics so you can write them down and remember them? No. Every day, God did the impossible. Every single day. The nation of Israel would have stretched over most of what you and I know as the state of Rhode Island. And God every day brought to the camp a sufficient supply of food. You and I do not face a problem God can't handle. And I can assure you there are only two possibilities. If God doesn't supply, then number one, God wants to produce a change in my life. What change that is, I don't know, and you may not know yet, but that's one thing to consider. Possibility number two is God may be using our need to call us to himself, and there may be a need that we've never considered that God is simply holding off to keep us in suspense and get our attention to finally say, God, what are you wanting? Just as he spoke to Samuel, Samuel responded, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And God sometimes just wants our attention. But this morning as we come to the Lord's table, 
I'd like to say several things that are important and then ask you if you would to turn to John chapter 6 in the New Testament. If you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior, you've been born again, the Spirit of God has drawn you to Christ and you have trusted Christ alone. Your hope before God is not in yourself, it is not in your religion, it is not in rituals, it is simply in the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you have trusted Christ alone, I would encourage you later this morning when the elements are passed to join us. This is not our table. This is not the local church's table. This table speaks of the universal church and the universal blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for the remission of all sins throughout the whole world. So if you know Christ as Savior, I would encourage you to partake. But also at this time, I'd like to remind you that if you do not, not know Christ as your Savior, these elements will do you no good. It would be the equivalent of wearing a wedding band and never having made a commitment to another person. It would be hypocrisy. These are symbols only for believers, and there's nothing wrong with bypassing the elements when they come to you if you do not know Christ. But more importantly, I'd like to say, as I often have said, if you don't know Christ, I'll be glad to give you time if you'll simply let me know that you'd like to talk. If you have your Bibles open to John 6, and if you do not have a Bible, in John chapter 6, Jesus preaches the longest message he ever recorded in Scripture. That doesn't mean that it has more content. But this message filled this day. And when Jesus Christ preached it, amazingly, the Bible tells us much of his crowd walked away. Those who were unsaved did not want to hear what he had to say. His message was that narrow and that demanding. This is the same Lord Jesus who said in Matthew that broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that go in that thereat. Because narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. Speaking of narrow is not speaking of strictness. Speaking of narrow is actually reminding us there is one way. There are not multiple ways to God. The idea that there are multiple religions and multiple denominations and multiple rituals is not what the Bible teaches. The only way any of us go to heaven is by personal faith in Jesus Christ, having had a personal experience where the Spirit of God took the Word of God and drew us to the cross of Calvary. And as sinners deserving hell, we called upon the name of the Lord and God graciously saved us. That is the only message the scripture proclaims. When Jesus speaks to these people, they really don't believe he is God in the flesh. They are questioning that. And so what unfolds is a discussion that goes back to Exodus 16. They are interested in Jesus Christ proving to them he is God. If he's God, he can perform miracles. And so we begin at verse 30. <clears throat> John 6, beginning at verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? I'd encourage you to note the word sign in your Bible. The book of John is the gospel of signs. And Jesus Christ, throughout the early portion of this book, goes through a number of symbols, a number of scenes, whereby a particular event is actually an arrow pointing to him as being God. Many of you know one of the first of those. Jesus, at the wedding of Cana, turned water into wine. That was a sign. So now they're asking him, would you give us a sign? Notice the text. 
Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They are pointing back to Moses, the great prophet. And let me remind you, Moses, just before his death, reminded them that God would, in the latter days, send a prophet like himself. And so they're saying, if you're equivalent to, if you're of the stature, if you're of the position that Moses held, at least you could provide bread. Remember, he's fed 5,000. He'll feed 4,000. Verse 32. Jesus responds to their requests with these words. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Pause for a moment. They ate bread. Moses did not produce it. That is his point. The bread that they ate didn't come from the hands of Moses, so they've already implied something that is not true. It's amazing when you pick the Bible up. We are looking at the mind of God. And very often we will take the Bible and attempt to reduce it to a very narrow meaning. Call it our theology. Call it our creed. Call it our doctrinal statement. And the truth of the matter is, in the midst of our creeds, our doctrinal statements, our confessions of faith, all of these things cannot be as broad as the mind of God. And so he reminds them, Moses didn't provide the bread. The bread came directly from heaven to earth. And that's the critical point he is about to build on. That the need for humanity to live and bread is considered a staple of life. Man shall not live by bread alone. And as a person, every one of us needs the word of God. Well, the word of God is actually God himself incarnate. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was in essence deity, was God. And the Word was made flesh, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. So now he's about to build a bridge for them to understand that the manna is a picture of himself. Notice, if you would, will please, the end of verse 32. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven... For the bread of God is, notice, he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Let me stop and point something out. We who know Christ as Savior think of this table, these elements, and bread with regard to our hope. Our hope of heaven. Our hope of the forgiveness of God. Our hope of standing before a holy God and facing his judgment and being covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's our hope. But Jesus is now telling us something else we have forgotten. This table is a reminder of our life. Go back in your mind to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told, you can eat of every tree in the garden except one. I find it very interesting that in our desire to get people to live scriptural, we had rule upon rule, law upon law, demand upon demand, and we build all of these structures around the simple statement of God. God in the beginning laid for us an understanding of how the mind of God operates. Here is absolute truth. Here is the center. And as long as you don't do this, you can enjoy these benefits. Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the garden. And God had told them that the day they ate of it, they would surely die. Now, most of you who've read your Bible know that in Genesis chapter 3, they didn't cease to exist. There was no funeral service. There was no burial. 
They physically existed. But according to the Bible, when they ate, they died in some respect. They lost life. And so when we pick the Bible up and we read of the bread from heaven, God is about to give us a picture of how the life they lost is restored to a person. It is not found in us. It is not found through us. It is discovered by us. It is given to us. But it is not something that we have on this level. It was lost. And until God gives what he took, it cannot be restored. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see. And the word see is ideon, from which we get our English word idea. He can't even comprehend the kingdom of God. It's just not possible. And so Jesus is in this scene telling these Jews a religious group enmeshed in biblical, as it were, Judaism, the historic text of the Bible, recipients of the oracles of God to whom God gave the commandments and God gave the ordinances and God gave the tabernacle and God gave the sacrificial system. And Jesus says, I'm telling you right now, the only way that you can get the quality of life that God wants is it has to come directly from heaven to you. Well, let me stop and say this. Many of us think that if we conform religiously, that that's how we get life. And that is not the case. There is only one way for life to be transferred from the bottom. And that is, it is lifted by what is above it. A cow takes grass from the field and it becomes the life in the cattle. A man kills the cow and eats the beef, and it becomes life in the man. And in like fashion, until God himself does something, nothing we do, nothing we are, is going to produce life. What is above must reach down and lift it up. And in order for the life that God wants to exist, God himself has to reach down and grant it, if you please. Notice the text, verse 33. <clears throat> for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The life of Jesus Christ is the only life that men and women can receive that is of eternal consequence. I want to say this Sometimes we talk about my Christian life, our Christian life. I have news for you from a biblical standpoint. There's only one life, the Christ life. It's that extent, that singular, that alone. Christ must live in me. That's the life. And so Jesus reminds them that that was the purpose of his coming into the world, his incarnation, God becoming flesh to give life to humanity. Verse 34, they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. You may think they've got it, but I know that they do not comprehend it. If they understood that he is the bread of life, it would not be this. They would be saying, give us yourself. Listen carefully. Jesus clarifies for them. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. There are a number of illustrations that God has given to us to give us a broad picture of what God does when he saves us. Remember in John, Jesus said, I am the door. Why the door? The door is a means of entrance. And the only way a person can enter into eternal life is through the door, Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the water of life. 
Because some people understand what it is for their soul to quench. There is a thirst. There is a yearning. There is a desire for something to satisfy, and we can't find it. And now Jesus uses this illustration, I'm the bread of life. If you've ever been truly hungry, you understand what hunger pangs are. Most people don't want to consider their hunger. We tend, when we think of the spiritual realm, to actually be like the bear that sleeps through the winter. If you just leave us alone, we'll be just fine because we won't even be conscious that we have a need. But wake the bear up, and all of a sudden the bear realizes, I need something. And craving begins to start. And Satan has a wonderful way of giving us substitutes for that which really satisfies us. When I was a teenager, I went through the same stages every teenager goes through. And as a teenage boy, I was enmeshed in religion and truthfully did not know Christ as my Savior. But I was looking for satisfaction in life. There are a number of things I tried. I never tried alcohol. And you say, why? Because I had an uncle that lived with us. He was an alcoholic, and I couldn't stand the smell of whiskey. Couldn't stand the smell of brandy. Couldn't stand the smell of beer. But cigarettes, that was another story. And I thought that satisfying the flesh, the body, was what was the most important thing in the world. Well, that's exactly what's going on in our culture. We are looking for satisfaction, and we're going to broken cisterns that hold no water, attempting to find satisfaction. Every teenager that goes through teenage rebellion, they're searching, they're seeking, they're thirsting, they're hungering, they're yearning for something. And they may not can fully understand it, but the truth of the matter is, the solution to every need in the heart of man. Adults, we become a little bit more uh, sophisticated. We're not going for the things that destroy us. Let's go for wealth. Let's go for power. Let's go for popularity. It is still a substitute for the bread of life. And so when we come to this passage, Jesus goes on to say this. Verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. That yearning, that emptiness, that desire for something worth having that fills our being is filled in Jesus Christ. This passage goes on at verse 48. Let's drop down there. Jesus says, then... I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread of life which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. When Jesus Christ died in simple biblical terminology, God was providing a sacrifice for sin in order to give us life within. Ian Thomas of the Ambassadors said it this way, Christ died for me that the Holy Spirit might live within me. And so what you have in this particular image is life returning to be within us and life given for us that we might be accepted before God. It's all God. Salvation from beginning to end, internally and eternally, is always God-given. Now with that in mind, I'd like to go back to the scene in Exodus 16 and show you how this Old Testament story pictures the work of salvation. First of all, the concept. 
The concept of bread from heaven pictures for us Jesus Christ as God coming from heaven. Notice Exodus 16, verses 14 and 15. I'm sorry, verse 4 and 15. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Will we really depend upon his bread? Or will we come to the table, taste his bread, but we aren't really desirous to be filled with that alone? That was the test. Verse 15. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? Manna. For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. What is God teaching Israel? And what does the manna illustrate for us about Jesus Christ? Notice John 3, verse 6. In John 3, Jesus said it this way, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. If I may say it this way, in our natural state, we contribute nothing to our salvation. Who we are, what we are, what we've done contributes nothing to this line. In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said it this way, it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing. And the flesh is not referring to skin. It's a much broader term than skin. It is referring to all of humanity. Everything I am is insufficient, inadequate, and contributes nothing. Take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And this is the only time I'll ask you to turn this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. In the book of Ephesians, you are reading the account of a Gentile congregation. They have been saved out of paganism. They do not have the religious heritage of the Jews. And so when we come to this passage... What we're about to read in the scripture is what the scripture says is a description of a lost man in his normal state. It has an expression that I want to draw your attention to that I think many times we don't even slow down long enough to understand what we read. And we've been told something very radical. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and notice if you would please. Verse number 17. Paul says to the Ephesians, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles or pagans walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened. And then notice this expression in light of today's message being alienated from the life of God. I said this a moment ago, I'm going to say it again. There is only one Christian life. Not your life versus your life. Not your life versus my life. The Bible only knows one Christian life, and that is the life of Jesus Christ. Say, I don't quite understand this. That's why I want to take some time this morning. Because I think in a Bible-believing church, most of us understand Christ is our hope. I'm not sure we understand Christ is our life. Galatians 2, verse 20. Most of us remember this verse begins, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Not I. Then he goes on to say, And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. When a person becomes a Christian, what was lost in the Garden of Eden is restored in the indwelling Holy Spirit. Adam and Eve were alive physically, but spiritually they were dead. <clears throat> Their relationship with God was severed. They could live good, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> they could live good, clean, moral lives from the standpoint of what we call culture, but they were damned because they lost the life of God. When you pick the New Testament up and you begin to read the New Testament, the New Testament radically builds on this. When we talk about growing as a Christian, most of us think of growing as a Christian as, I do more, I go more, I give more, I work more. That's not the New Testament pattern. The New Testament pattern is a vessel that becomes more and more filled. Let me quote several verses. John 10.10 10, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. John 14.6 I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 for me to live is Christ. See, we add a preposition in there. We say is for Christ. That's not what Paul said. The Christian does live for Christ, but the life itself is the Christ life within me. It's the only life the Bible knows that is eternal. John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In the book of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul tells us that the desire of God is that we eventually are strengthened in the inner man so that we are filled to all the fullness of God. We come to this table, and you know what we're saying at this table? We're saying two things. Not past tense, he died for me. That's not the only thing we're saying. What we're also saying is, I want to continue to feed upon him, to feast upon him, until he consumes my very being. That's what we're supposed to be saying. And that element is almost lost in the modern church. Because our concern is not to have life and have it more abundantly. It is often just to be forgiven and now leave me alone. I'm not sure that that's Christian life. I'm not sure that's the Christ life. I'm not sure that's what God designed. God doesn't divide the work of the Spirit from the work of the Son. The work of the Spirit is to bring to perfection what the Son purchased by his blood. When he was sacrificed, he saved me from the penalty of sin, and now the Spirit of God is living within me, and it is the continuous work until the day of my death of the Spirit of God to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. It will not be perfected in my lifetime. I will not find that I've been delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God until I step into eternity. And there are things about this that we do not understand, and we're not going to reduce it to a formula. But what I'm telling you is a biblical reality. And so as we come to the table, it's not just about the past. It's about the present taking us into the future. The coming of Christ is seen in the manna. How is that true? Because the bread came from heaven, Exodus 16 and verse number 4. One of the differences between us and some of the cults is we understand that the Bible teaches that salvation is God our Savior. The name Jesus is the equivalent of Joshua in the Old Testament 
And the Greek word Jesus and the Old Testament Hebrew word Joshua, both translated, become this, God our Savior. There are cults that believe that Jesus Christ was a man. Many of them will teach that Jesus Christ was just a normal man up until his baptism. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and the Spirit of God was with him up until he died. And when he died, the Spirit of God abandoned him. Well, the Spirit of God's ministry was what Jesus Christ served the Father by, illustrating for us how we can do the same. But that being said, Jesus Christ is not just a man. Why? The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1, And you, has he made alive, quickened is the way it's translated, born again in some translations, and you, has he made alive, who were dead in trespasses, and in sins, wherein you walked in time past according to the flesh or according to the desires, according to the culture, where Satan is the dominion over the culture. Every man is a sinner. And if Jesus Christ were a normal man, Jesus Christ would have been born a sinner. He came in the womb of Mary. <clears throat> But it did not happen by conception as we understand the term. Jesus Christ was placed in the womb of Mary by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That which is in you is of the Holy Spirit, Luke chapter number 1. There are elements about who he was that we do not fully understand, but we know what the Scripture teaches. We know that the Scripture teaches, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. And so God had to provide God the Father a perfect sacrifice because there are only two ways to get to heaven. Perfection without condemnation or God himself. Since all of humanity is condemned and all of humanity is a sinner, it offers no hope. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. The flesh profits nothing. So God, in eternity past, determined, I will send God the Son to die for sin and provide a means of salvation. Remember these words from 1 John chapter number 2? John tells us, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so Jesus Christ symbolized in the bread, is God coming down to be our Savior. Oh, the sacrifice was needed, but the sacrifice would be useless if he were a man. We had a neighbor who lived across from us for many years in Florida, and we tried to reach her for Christ. She was a member of a cult. One day I was outside painting our windows, and she came over, and I knew I was going to be in trouble if she stayed for any length of time. We had 29 windows in that house. I worked my way from window one all the way around to window 27. And she talked to me and talked to me and talked to me and talked to me. And finally, I realized what she believed. She started off by reminding me that that which is flesh is flesh. And the life of the flesh must be given as a sacrifice. By the time we got to the end, I realized that she did not believe Jesus Christ was God. And I looked at her and I said, if you believe what you have told me all day long that you believe, I do not mean to offend you, but you're going straight to hell. Now that doesn't sound good, but the truth of the matter is, would you like me to tell someone who has cancer that they don't have cancer? See, honesty when it comes to spiritual things today is considered threatening, intimidating, cruel. Anything but what God intended it to be. The only hope we have is what the truth is. And so when we pick the Bible up, we come to the realization only God, by himself, through himself, for himself, 
can save humanity. There is no other hope. There is no other possibility. If you're following Jesus Christ, trying to be like him to get to heaven, I assure you, you won't want to hear this, but you're on your way to hell. If you believe in all the symbols of Christianity and accept all the rituals of Christianity and all the rules of Christianity, but have never received Jesus Christ, you do not have the life. John 1.11, he came to his own and his own received him not. But to those who received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. The true believer comes to the table recognizing, I need the bread. And God demonstrated the bread of life when he commended his love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. Do you realize when the bread came, <clears throat> of all places it could have come to, it came to a wilderness place, a barren place, a desert. And every one of us were in our own barrenness when Jesus Christ came. Filled with religion, filled with ritual, filled with ethics, filled with morality, filled with culture, filled with education, but no life. I remind you of the verse I just quoted a few moments ago. And you has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins. I remind you that for many years I lived in fear of hell. I had this uneasy sense that one day I would stand before God. I knew he had the right to judge me. I feared if he judged me, would I pass his judgment? I want to say this, and I say this very kindly, but it's the truth. When you die, it doesn't matter what you think of yourself. You can pass all of your own standards, rules, and hurdles. When we die, we stand before God, and there's only one judge. And the judge is not asking, have you sinned? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He, he isn't asking, what do you think you deserve? Because the wages of sin is eternal separation from God, death. All he's asking is the simple question. Do you have the life of Christ for you and in you? And let me remind you lastly of this very simple fact. Jesus Christ, like the bread, came to people who didn't want it. You think that those Jews were starving for the bread from heaven? We remember the leeks and the garlics and the onions which we ate in Egypt. We remember the flesh pots we had in Egypt. It was always better going back. And to some people who've made a profession of faith, they think we've lost out. Unsaved people have it better than us. They do. Give them the wealth of the world. Give them the pleasures of the world. Give them popularity. Give them power. They're damned to hell forever. The only thing that saves us from hell is Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other truth. There is no other life. And Israel wasn't looking for it. And I wasn't looking for God to tell me I needed his life. The night that I knelt in my pastor's office and I asked Jesus Christ to save me. I had religion. I had the right religion, at least culturally speaking. I had the right kind of church. And good kind of people to be with. But I was on my way to hell. Because I did not know Christ as my savior. I had been to the table many times. But I would never eaten of the bread of life. And this morning. You don't need the table. 
if you've never been to Calvary. Because our hope is in Christ alone. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, as we come to you today, we're so mindful of so many things that this story illustrates for us. The bread that the nation of Israel ate, they only ate it by going out and receiving it. In our world, where we're busy earning a living, providing for a family, accomplishing our education, making our mark in life, attempting to take care of basic human responsibilities, you've called upon us to give attention to the Spirit and our need in the spiritual realm. And the bread reminds us of that. Every person who partook of that bread had to stoop. And no one can come to Jesus Christ filled with themselves, their own self-righteousness, the arrogance to think that we, a sinful people, can stand before you with any other than the righteousness of Christ credited to our account. How foolish, how ignorant, how arrogant. And Father, they had to actually swallow. The Bible tells us to taste the Lord and see that he is good. We are reminded in Revelation that in heaven, we will enjoy the manna of God even in eternity. We will never find ourselves from now all throughout eternity, if we're saved, not falling to our knees and crying holy, holy, holy. Thank you for the precious lamb of glory. Thank you for the wonderful promise that we can look to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his cross work and we can live. May these truths fill us and then, Father, may we feast upon that in such a way that Christ begins to fill our being to all the fullness of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.